Mini Matters, a miniature and painting podcast. Hi guys, welcome to this limited series with Mini Matters where we talk about three of my favourite things. Uh, comic books, miniature art, and of course, the work by Afonso Geraldes. Welcome to the show, Alfonso. Thank you very much. Hi, Jamie. How are you? You okay? <laughs> not bad, not bad. It's good Great. to have you both here. Brilliant. Let's get stuck in. Um, over this series, we're going to look at comic book art in general, where we can draw inspiration from, whether there's any lessons that can be learned. And then more excitedly, we're going to look at Alfonso's work, which has been inspired by comic books, where he gives us some hints and tips about what we can use and borrow and hopefully using our own pieces. So with that in mind, I thought it'd be useful first to look at some of the comic book art that has caught my eye, which should be on our screen now, Jamie. Is Ooh, that correct? Yeah. Well, it is now, yep. Great. I thought the first thing, obviously, when you look at comic books, the first thing that strikes you for me is- But it's not in mine, guys. It's not in my screen, so you have to send it's it Hellboy. to WhatsApp. Well, yeah. It's on WhatsApp. It's on your WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the no, Hellboy it's... fighting uh, the Beast of right. Vagra. Okay. Vagra. Okay. So I thought the first thing, the first and most obvious thing to talk about is probably comic book colour. Um, Alfonso, obviously, this is something you explored while you were at Night Models, um, mm. and it's a hurdle that you, you had to overcome. Uh, maybe you could tell the audience a bit about it. But you mean ab uh, about each uh, cover or a little bit about everything? About... I mean, you want to analyse or, or, or you want yeah, to speak we could... about about the experience will, in, in night models regarding to this topic i think both would be interesting i will just start off though with uh like a, a thing that since i've been on learning about painting art and all that the comic books fascinate me more and more like as a kid when i read manga stuff i was just like yeah it's all right i had no real appreciation for it but now when i look at them i genuinely find it baffling that they can produce so many, obviously they have time to do them, but so many high quality pieces with such color and with such a fluidity. I think, I think obviously this isn't a direct question, but <clears throat> that's well, the thing I that it, I find. I think that at least uh, to me and probably um, to, the, to the miniature painting community, because uh, back at the time of Night Models, there was nothing like this before, basically. So we came from a from a traditional of, of, of more historical things, you know, historical topics, and obviously more traditional ways of painting, basically. Uh, so when I started in a models, that was a very a very young, well, really a new a new company that appears suddenly. I remember the the conversation with the owner of Nine Models uh, the day that we meet. We we were. Uh, previously, uh, we worked uh, for Andrea Miniatures. Previously, he was, I was there like a like a trainee or or, or starting my career. He was already uh, <clears throat> a very known painter and and sculptor as well. <clears throat> and some years later, he called me to propose me this uh, this new idea. And when when we had this meeting, and he started to 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 explain what was the the goals of the of the of that, that new company and he told me that we will start working with uh, with marvel and, and star wars well obviously the idea fascinates me because it was something new uh, that was impossible to think about this before that because actually uh, there are plenty of companies that they are producing very uh, amazing uh, artworks amazing sculpts and and, and paint jobs by amazing artists, full of colors, um, effects, you know. Actually, we are doing, in general, the miniature world is going through the illustration, you know. It's, it's like, it's more similar to digital illustration than than, uh, than anything else, right? But back at this time, it was something completely new. Um, just to point out what was this, the, the situation, all the, <clears throat> the tricks, all the uh, procedures, all the ideas and, and the methods that we we were using they were uh, super traditional step-by-step -step processes very very close always with the same tools with the same um, with the same pigments with the same procedures you know that were somehow 
told by generation to the next generation, you know, uh, like a kind of mantra that you have to repeat, that you have to do this with the base code, uh, and then add the first two layers of light. And then, so it was like very structurized, very traditional. And the result was more, um, how do I say, like, <clears throat> with a lack of life somehow, you know, like more dull, more grayish. Everything was searching for a kind of realistic, realistic representation uh, based on uh, smooth blendings, uh, representation of materials in a more natural way somehow. However, the, the result was not nothing realistic at all because you know cenital source light is not something realistic and, but the idea behind it it was completely different so what happened with this that uh, when he proposed me uh, to, to enter in this project the first time I, I went to the company and I started to work uh, officially uh, with them because they hired me uh, well they hired me um, the, thing, <laughs> the thing I found it was that trying to make the first sketches. I, I remember I started with Star Wars, uh, and it was a, a miniature of Han Solo, uh, that it was pretty close to historical style yet, you know? Uh, it was nothing especially new, but the next models, including the duel between Anakin and Obi-Wan, and the first miniatures of Marvel, especially Marvel, mm -hmm. um, when we started to do the research for the, uh, the inspiration, let's say, we realized something that was obvious, that was, uh, well, we cannot really, um, how can I say, like re replicate or imitate or represent a comic style, first, with this kind of procedures, second, with this kind of colors. Mm. Because the, the methods that we were using, they were all based on dilution, subtlety, um, being completely... Um, how can I say, non-aggressive non with, with the contrast, you know, like low contrast, everything uh, perfectly blended, uh, no exaggeration at all, and comic books, especially comic covers, which is what interests me uh, the most, uh, they were the opposite, you know, with super strong contrast, places where you can play with pure, pure black, something that in miniature... Uh, there is not a real good way to, to achieve because black turns gray as soon as you uh, turn the figure and light hits, it turns it gray. So we, 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 we struggle with this, me and Jose Palomares, that we were like the main, uh, the two main painters and also uh, Jose Manuel Caballero del Sol, who was the owner and also he was also painting. Uh, we were struggling because it was really almost impossible to get to that point of super bright colors, explosive contrast and impacting uh, impacting uh, images, right? That on a comic uh, on a comic cover, it depends on several factors. First of all, especially the new generation of comics. I'm not talking about the 80s or early 90s. I'm talking about mm -hmm. when, the, the, when the digital uh, printing uh, came. I don't know if this is a word in English, but you know, when they, when they, you remember that they, they were painting with dots, no? It was yeah, like, sure. and, then, and then when they move into the digital printing, yep. uh, the colors were much more alive, basically, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we found that we had to, to, to search for something new. So we decided to go to an art store, basically, to, I remember that day, like if it was yesterday, uh, to search for colors, to, to buy a full set of, of uh, new paints. And, and we found the inks and the heavy bodies, basically. So before that time, most, or I will say, the majority of the painters in the world, they were using uh, either oils, that they were obviously more vibrant and more intense, or mainly, the majority, acrylics, because obviously the use of acrylic is much easier, it's, it's more simple to, to, to work with acrylic, and it's faster as well, and it's more varied, it's more versatile. Uh, but Obviously, Vallejo paints, Andrea paints, Prince August paints, all those paints were really matte, really dull, and really uh, not, not intense in terms of pigment, you know, right? So we found the, the heavy bodies, uh, we found the golden acrylic, and then we found inks. Uh, and it was somehow related also with the memories that we had of the old Citadel uh, color range that was quite intense. 
uh, and much more vibrant than than let's say Vallejo, for example. Which is, uh, don't get me wrong, they are good colors, but each one has their own goal or they, they have their own finish. And and also people have to understand that it's not the same the colors that you perceive on a screen, because the screen always enhances the colors rather than the, the the real color that you have on hand in, in your hand. And I have been always very obsessive with matching the the image that you have in your screen with the image that the collector or the owner of the company will have in his hand right so to achieve those vibrant colors we we had to change the the, the complete range of colors basically to achieve that these colors this vibrancy and this great impact that we were analyzing back at this time uh how, how, they how did long it. ago was that what, what? how <laughs> how long ago was that like 10 15 what, years what, by what you mean the the research or, or what How yeah long? when you when you had the inspiration so, to move but wh when it was or how long it took to to change uh, when question. it was yeah what year it was oh. about 2010 wasn't it or maybe a little bit earlier maybe 2009 something like this 2008 2009 uh, it's not well, long, is no, it? no 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 listen i mean it was i think it was yeah 2009 or 8 i, I mean i don't have uh, a good memory so sorry yeah, but before, <clears throat> the, pre the previous decade so mm. so well it, it was the, f the first thing it was to to make a comparison with what we were achieving and and the miniatures that we used to paint uh, in a professional way with really high standards back in the day mm. in, in that in that that moment uh especially comparing with the with the things that were that were developed previously in andrea miniature miniatures that Obviously, some some artworks were a little bit more risky. Like, for example, there were some artworks by Jose Manuel Palomares that they were more into the fantasy illustration, but more a kind of like Frazetta style or something like this, which is still very painterly, you know, and it still uh, reminds these more uh, classic colors, uh, more more mute, more or, or less impacting. You know, it's not. Is not the kind of color that you will find in a in a cover of a, of a of a comic book. And indeed, if you see the covers of the comic books, normally they are satin. Mm. Why? Why they are mm -hmm. satin? Because it, the satin colors always translate the idea of vibrancy much better, right? So that was one of the main keys of saying, okay, maybe we need to translate this vibrancy by using this new uh, new game of colors right a new game of pigments let's say and now let's see how we can use this because obviously uh, these colors were already used by many other artists of other fields but translating this into miniatures is what it was not easy because they were ultra satin which is the it is the problem right uh, you can create something really impressive that looks amazing in hand but as soon as you cannot take a decent picture and as soon as it creates you know like shines or sparks everywhere without control it's a big problem maybe not for a for a personal collector or for your personal collection let's say uh, but yes for a box art you know that th these were box arts so we had to combine the, the idea of using more intense or i would say better pigments but also changing the procedure the procedures and also um controlling this final outcome this final finish to avoid that it was uh, maybe too aggressive that it couldn't be controlled by the by the camera for the boxer uh, final look you know mm. i don't know if this makes sense or not yeah no that's right yeah um oh, i don't obviously i, I don't so. want to go <laughs> jamie, jamie makes something like uh, uh, yeah I, it's I, fine like, you didn't even need to ask it was so Perfect. I obviously don't want to go too much on a tangent on down this direction, but I just need to ask a question while we're there. The Spanish style was is, is known for being highly saturated and that use of colours. Is it fair to say that that creation happened then with the night model movements, or am I crediting you with something that probably isn't isn't right? Well, I think I think definitely yes, because indeed the Spanish the previous Spanish style was completely the opposite, but not because of yeah. me. I mean, because of what that happened in that moment. Yeah. It was a kind of bubble, you know, that at some point explode, uh, explode, yeah, um, blow up, um, yeah. and obviously then some of the, the next generations they have 
taken this and and, and taken into a into a higher level. That that, that that's mm. something obvious. But I can bet that the majority of people that nowadays are highlight are highlighted. You know, like Arnau Lazaro or Marmas Clans or Navida Roba or or Sergio mm. Calvo or uh, the one that you can imagine, uh, Rodrigo Acore. All the Spanish big names. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, they have. They have absorbed this, you know. It's obvious. It's, ob it's obvious. Yeah. They, they have yeah. collected those figures. I don't know if all of them, but most of them, for real, you know, uh, because it, it makes sense. Indeed, you get the, the proof for this is, for example, me in 2006 that I won two slayer swords in the Golden Demon, and I did it with something that looked historical, because I came from the yeah. from the traditional mm. uh, Spanish way of painting that was completely the opposite. It was based more on the cenital source light, but the colors were more on were more based on I don't know Pepe Gallardo style, Julio Cabos, Raúl García La Torre, Rodrigo Hernández Chacón. So the, the classic uh, Spanish painters that they were painting in a more mm. in a more traditional way in terms of the especially of the use of colors. So somehow. Uh, night models was a change in the miniature industry. Obviously, the miniature industry was not as big as it is mm. right now uh, because there were no companies that were producing, for example, fan fantasy or sci-fi sci style. Uh, and now you have, I don't know, dozens of them that are producing great stuff. But back at this time, only Andrea were doing something related with fantasy. That was the first uh, fantasy line ever created but by uh, mainly by... Um, Jose Manuel Palomares and Joaquin Palacios and some other people that we were also around it, you know, like giving ideas or, or, or observing the, 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 the starting uh, say the starting shine of this movement, right? Uh, but the, the next stage, the, net, the next step was Night Models because when they acquired the, the license, right, of Marvel and Star Wars, they were opening new doors. Because it mm -hmm. was not, it was not anymore like Andrea Miniatures producing a Spider-Man and calling uh, with any other name to avoid the the legal consequences. You know what? <laughs> you, you know what I mean? That yeah. was that at, at the end. That was something licensed under a license, and it was uh, something uh, legal, and it was something that has to be approved by Marvel, and it was something that it has to be approved mm -hmm. by Star Wars. So that that was an, a very important thing because they they are they will not approve something that that it, it, first that has no quality or second that, that it doesn't match the idea that they have you know you cannot represent an a specific uh, Thor or Daredevil from a specific author you cannot represent it in a in a completely different way because they will not accept that right and also because I I must admit that here the 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 owner of night models who is who is or, or was i mean i don't have a relationship with him right now but he was a, an, an amazing i mean he knew a lot about comic because his father was a um a comic shop owner so mm -hmm. he he know he know everything about comics he was a comic lover and he was super obsessed as well to create a, a great legacy of uh miniature icons related with with comics you know so mm -hmm. I think I think for me personally as well, up until that point, my only reference had been the the heavy metal style in Games Workshop painting. Uh, mm. Before I I got into model painting, it was it was comic books. I read them, you know, from the age of ten upwards. And I think obviously I learned about you as as with most artists from your work as opposed to who you were as a person. And I remember seeing the the stuff you had done at Night Models for the <laughs> first time, and it just blew me away. And it's because of that use of color. Obviously, growing up. With comic books and then seeing how you translated that it was it was an assault on the senses i i think when i first saw those colors they were so rich i, I liken it to going into a sweet shop they were they, they were so rich i could almost taste them and i'd <laughs> never seen I, I i'd never seen color used like that and that's when i thought i need to find out who's done this and, and i need to learn more about it. up until that point I hadn't seen that style. And I think that's why now I'm so enamored with the Spanish style as it's been taught painting, because obviously they use that <clears> color <throat> and it's something that stuck with me. And I think it's because of my love of comic book art growing up. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. <laughs> I have really good no. memories of that of that period because of that, because because I I need I mean I think that we all knew beside the the I mean obviously the, the problems uh, or the maybe that we were not doing something ma massively sold, you know, because it, they were 
the, the, the industry was pretty, it is very small and it was even smaller. Uh, but we, I think that we had the feeling uh, back in that time that we were like somehow changing the game and it can, it can look pretend, it can, it can sound pretentious, but I think that after many years, uh, there is a proof of this, you know, yeah. because, because actually now when you see the works of Big Child, for example, which obviously they have taken the, um, I don't know who was the word, like when you are in a, in a run Concept, idea. and they take your, and they continue. Yeah, yeah the word, they continue your yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah they, they continue like the legacy, you know. So what what yeah. what what Big Child is doing right now is is uh, this kind of thing, you know. Uh, and also, probably some other uh, factors, like for example the 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 birth of uh, Infinity as well. I think that yeah. this also yeah. was a, a, a big impact, but obviously that affected uh, more on the war game inside because it was a different thing. But I think that both ways of understanding uh, the appliance of colors in a more aggressive way has, they have created somehow a kind of um, identity that defines mm -hmm. the Spanish style and that somehow has influenced so many people to the point that actually if you name, let's say, I don't know, the 30 more influential painters in the world, easily there are eight, 10 Spanish people, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. I find it probably, weird. Pro pro probably, probably. The Spain and, and, has so many. That's why I, I, I find that genuinely, I don't know, I suppose a, a country has to have more, but you've got sculptors, like for example, all the people that I dealt with who did all the models for my dragon head, every single person was Spanish from start to finish, it's just like, is there a reason why, because I was talking about this with Natalia as well, about Polish painters and why Spanish painters, and not just painters though, like designers, concept artists. Painters. I think I think is the, tra is the tradition at the end, uh, we, we are a country of artists, mm. especially, especially, I would say, especially focus on painting more than sculpting, but basically painting but miniature art in Spain has been very big. The main company of the history of, of miniatures has been Andrea Miniatures, the, one of the biggest ones and probably the, probably the most important and the most influential. Nowadays, they are not in the best shape. Uh, but back in that time, it was Andrea and then Pegaso. You know, these were like Italians and Spanish. But also, I think that the fact that Games Workshop is in, in the UK has somehow created a kind of bubble that obviously now many uh, English painters are coming out of this bubble and, and testing the, and, and, and proving that they are also amazing, like Andy Wardle. But even even the other the other painters that are great from England, like David Soper or um, Darrell Latham, all these people are still painting uh, 28 mils yeah. more, than, more than anything else. And, and many others, you know, that they are also great painters. I know Demon Rich, I think is also from, from England. Right, so yeah. all, all those all those people are amazing painters and they bring now the, this illustration style into the uh, 28 mil uh, scale, which is fantastic. Mm. I follow all of them. I, I love their work a lot. <laughs> but the truth is that um, the majority of the, the core uh, of the the painters that were uh, exchanging, traveling, going to courses. Uh, I started giving classes in 2005 or 2000, yeah, 2004 mm. or 2005. That was not common in, in other countries. The community was not that strong. You know, here we had a very big tradition of historical painters uh, and somehow the new generation, the younger ones that were mainly uh, Jose Manuel Palomares, me, uh, and some others that were related with uh, with the with the games workshop with the golden demon, uh, they were somehow or we were somehow like jumping from one style to the other and bringing things from historical into fantasy and you know we were combining and obviously the 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 point where everything explode it was night models because night models it was like the red but red button that when you press it. Suddenly, you have a range of, of figures that you can use to express this necessity to use other techniques, other colors, and other ways of expressing the miniature painting art somehow. 
if that if that makes sense because obviously when you want to represent a magneto or magnet you call it magneto you call it magnet, yeah, magneto yeah magneto or or wolverine or anything that is full of leather uh, latex uh, spells or magical whatever powers you know uh, mm. then you need some contrast that you don't have in the classic style right mm. Yeah. And then the and then obviously this seed now has been developed into into something pretty impressive, I think. That is somehow conquering the I would say like the fantasy science fiction art world, but also it has affected the the historical side mm. through people like Kirill Kanaev. That is, it, he belongs to the same uh, generation as me, for example. Like Kirill has been in both sides as well, you know. Kirill was also, I think that Kirill is, Kirill is also back in that, in that time. Kirill is also a guy that has been very influential to what we are seeing right now because it was not related with comics. He didn't paint this kind of style, but I think that his use, more than his use of color, his use of contrast to achieve effects, it was a great reference for us okay. to adapt this to our necessity to create impacting images. Do you understand the point? Yeah, yeah. You extend his I, I, ideas, I, I, but with your style. I remember myself studying uh, the development of the non-metallic metal that was proposed by Kirill Kanaev and some others, like RJ, like Natalia Melik, like some of the people that were doing fantastic artworks in Cool Mini or Not back at the beginning of the 2000s, and also affected by the new fantasy from Rackham, for example, that was a French company that also it was a point of explosion, you know, it was a breaking point in the miniature world. And all these little things combined, I remember uh, studying this to apply it in, in our pieces as well, but with some other procedures. Because our obsession, it was that the miniatures shouldn't look amazing on a picture, but also in hand. And, yeah. and for example, we we brought the display to to Monte San Sabino because we were constantly reading on on there was the time of forums, online forums, and we were reading that it, this was not possible that this was Photoshop. So I remember bringing the Ghost Rider to Monte San Sabino and and observing the people from the distance, <laughs> and the, and it was quite fun, you know, because because the people were like. Like fuck is real, <laughs> you know. Because that was going like, to be my question: was did you know at the like now you're like we can look back and shit changed, right? Did you know back then were people perceiving it as such a big, not culture change, but so you know such a big shift in in the style? No, not really, because uh, in the miniature world uh, it's uh, affected by a very uh, <clears throat> bad virus, which is the. Well, two virus. One is the laziness. That means that sometimes it's easier to say that something is Photoshop or that is not, or that is fake or that cannot be real because I don't want to try to do it myself or because I've tried once and because I cannot do it. Then it means that the other one cannot do it as well. That is one, yeah. you know, or jealousy. I don't know what is the what is the correct word for this for this virus. And the other one is that it's a little bit as accepting. Accepting is the word. Accepting. Aesthetical. That when, as, you, don't, as, when you don't believe anything. All oh, right. Um, what's, what's the word, uh, Lionel? Come on, Lionel. Sort yourself out, mate. <laughs> <laughs> he asked you. He didn't ask me. So. Cynic, cynical. 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 Uh, oh, skeptical. Oh, skeptical. Okay. Fuck! It's your, it's your language, not mine. Yeah, you, you should know shit, it. <laughs> well, skeptical. So what I mean, I, I mean is like most of the comments that you read. They were obviously pra praises, you know, like saying, well, this is amazing. Uh, it's very inspiring, blah, blah, blah. Even more considering that I was one of the main part, the main members of the Spanish team forum, the extinct Spanish, Spanish team forum. I, I created this with, an, with, with the Spanish team, with us, another eight or 10 people. Uh, and this forum was pretty huge, like, I don't know, 3,000 people. Back in that time, that was really huge. Uh, and we were sharing constantly processes. You know, I remember I, I, I post the whole process of uh, uh, Iron Man bust, the, uh, not the whole process, but a lot of uh, pictures of the Ghost Rider, uh, Red School, all these things, they were shown on the, 
mm. on the forum because also I wanted to prove the people that that this could be done and that we were doing a, a, a very serious research about how to create certain effects and certain contrast and certain games of colors, contrast, uh, treatment on, of materials and so on uh, mm. in different ways than, than usual, right? But obviously, uh, there were always people saying uh, that cannot be, this is Photoshop. Like if doing it for, in Photoshop, it was something uh, easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, my, yeah. my, 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 my answer to this, it was always, if I knew how to do this in Photoshop, why, why will I be uh, doing this in, in, in real? I will, I will be colorizing for Marvel, maybe. You know what I mean? And I'm probably yeah, yeah. Er earning much, much more money. So... I, I don't think that people will, were thinking regarding to your question that this would change the perception of the miniature world or, or, or the miniature st uh, painting styles. But the fact that we started to make so many courses, it also created a ground of students that then they grew by themselves as well, you know, mm -hmm. and that they, they, they took this as their own uh, style or well, methods or I don't know uh, inspiration, and they also develop in some other ways, like Marmas clans, Diego Esteban, uh, Arsis, uh, all these all these people, you know, that were uh, next generation as well. Well, I don't know yeah. if this explains anything or not, or it's just grandfather's no, 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 no. stories. No, no, it makes complete sense. Yeah. Well, um, I'm, I've not said anything for the last like half an hour, which shows it's captivating. Just saying, Captain, you know, it shows I speak too much. Like the um, <laughs> the the thing I wanted to touch upon next, obviously, we've got some other photos, but I think I want to jump forward to to rim lights. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about it, and Alfonso, correct, you're you, you're in a better posi position to correct me if I'm wrong, but I've noticed that this seems to be quite in vogue in miniature painting at the moment. I'm seeing halo lights jump up everywhere. Mm. I'm seeing rim lighting jump up quite a lot, particularly with. <laughs> Some of the artists you mentioned before now although it appears to me and like i said i could be wrong because i'm not as, as versed with the work as you although it appears to be new to me now miniature art it has been existent in comic book art for quite a while so oh, i thought it'd be so so i would i thought it'd be useful to talk about one what a rim light is um why you would use it um and and, and how you could use it effectively in in, in models um wow. that's and a, why that it's is... such an unfortunate name as well <laughs> well, si si I mean, sincerely, the, a rim light is something that you can have in, a, in the real world. It's not something so strange, but obviously you will not find that much or that many rim lights uh, or at least so strong in classical canvases because the light that they had, it was light from a candles, maybe. For, but obviously, if, if uh, Caravaggio, if he was in, if he were, if he were or if he was. If he, if, he, was, if, he was. if he was, if he was, if he was in Tokyo, actually, full of neon lights everywhere, he will mm. probably paint uh, these rim lights as well because they they happen, but they happen in, in in extreme contrast situation, and the reason why they do it, they the reason why they use it that much, especially in, in comic uh, covers, is the same as the reason why they use it that much in. The covers of a, or the posters of a movie like Star Wars, and they mm. introduce you uh, a character like Darth Vader, and suddenly he has a kind of rim light to rescue the shape, basically. No, so it's a, light it's, is it's, just... a, it's a visual trick. It's a visual trick to to rescue certain shapes and to create interesting contrasts that mm. justify uh, an extreme use of color in a very re reduced. Uh, surface basically or a very reduced uh, area right mm. uh so there is I, I don't think that there is a probably there, there are like physical ways to explain how to use it and how to do it i don't i don't have those explanations because i'm not that kind of artist i think that uh, <clears throat> that the the way i perceive this is more uh how can i say like, I, I it, it moves what moves me is more my inspiration or, or when I feel that something is needed and indeed the way I started to to search for this uh, high contrast it was not even that I was copying literally because we we never had indeed we never had like a comic cover that was exactly the same as the as the miniature you know mm. 
So basically we had like many pictures that they were inspirational pictures and they had different treatment, the treatments and also different styles because the artists were, I don't know, the, the guys who has produced covers for the Punisher you have from Tim Bradstreet to, I don't know the names of the others, but many others, you know? Mm. Um, so it's, it, it's just a visual trick. It's like if you are, if I'm here and, and you want to portray me for the cover of the video and suddenly you want to highlight certain thing or because maybe my t-shirt is the same color as the wall and you want to make a, a, a contrast that will define the shape more and you come here and you place a, a, a focal light or, or even a, a mirror to, to reboot the light or something like that. So those are techniques that are usually used in photography is something quite quite common in cinema it's something quite common and obviously in comics where they are also using the background which the background in this case is a uh, is something that helps a lot uh, to create this atmosphere because for example the i'm, I'm seeing now the cover uh, of spawn uh, the 301 mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. spawn. And, and for and for example this one um they don't need the rim light, for example, to separate the black shape from the red. Black mm -hmm. will already be separated from the from the red, mm -hmm. the red, or the red of the cape. But maybe this gray bluish um, rim light, what helps is to create a glow, a glowing effect that <clears throat> defines a little bit less this area. It's not such a strong cut, yeah. right? So sometimes we use it to separate, but some other times. We use, you, we use it to uh, to even even to do the opposite or to harmonize certain things. So there, I don't think that there is a rule, especially of how to use it, you know, because mm -hmm. here in, in painting, there are many uh, painters that they they want to make maths out of everything. Right. And, uh, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I really don't feel I don't think that uh, that everything is under numbers you know what i mean it's more yeah. a kind of it's more a kind of feeling because i can bet that for example this uh, rim light in, in, in that indeed if you don't do it with this blue gray that is how i perceive it on the on this at least on my screen if you do it with a, with a kind of like neon green it will also do a very interesting effect but mm -hmm. maybe you will have to modify the rest of the elements to match this decision you know yeah. So obviously, also, uh, you cannot say, what is the way to do a rim light? Well, it depends on many factors. First of all, do I have a background? Do I have an element that that uh, works as a background, like a cape or a tree or a, or a flat background? Or do I have something behind? Yes, no. Uh, I'm going to leave the shape and that's it, or I'm going to fade it out uh so here it will be a rim light and then it will be blended into the surface or not mm -hmm. there are many different ways to tackle this topic mm -hmm. uh and definitely i don't find one way to explain all the situations i know currently on your patreon as well you've got a tutorial haven't you showing how to do a halo light yeah the one from uh, by david you mean <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, but for example, this is a good example of one interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. Because it's not that this is the way to do it, but obviously it's a kind of video that is more for uh, basic or intermediate painters, you know, not for mm -hmm. advanced ones. So for mm -hmm. an advanced painter, for example, this video could be uh, maybe a little bit, you know, like, um, I mean, it will not give too much in deep um, knowledge, right? But because we are an academy, so we have to do videos that has different levels of understanding, right? Mm. Well, if then you see the Hellboy process, for example, the Hellboy process, it has a lot of uh, topics that could be very useful, very beneficial to beginners. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm, I'm treating or I'm, I'm speaking about so many different moments with so many different ways to tackle the process and, and, and different techniques and different procedures. But also there are some other parts that are a little bit more advanced or that are a little bit more conceptual because some decisions, like for example, where to place the rim light on the Hellboy shape is not directly related with something realistic. Mm. 
indeed the moon is completely in the other side which is not directly related where is the moon because the moon is too big you know it will affect everything you know what i mean but but if you make a, a, a direct relationship between the moon where is placed the moon on the background and where the um, turquoise bluish rim light affects the miniature is not directly logically connected you know what i mean mm. it's it, it's more an, an aesthetical decision so that's the reason why there is not one way to do it because you can do it uh by a regular progression of base codes you know kappa bases place one uh, and then each other and you know like one one next to each other you can do it by filtering you can do it uh with errors you can do it with brush you can do it with colors that are satin you can do it with colors that are matte. If you do it with colors that are matte, it will work really well in, on a screen, but it will not work so well on your hand. Uh, if you do it with satin colors, then you will have to reduce this satiness or this glossiness in certain areas, you know? So those are technical aspects that I think that it, it it's much better to, let's say, analyze piece by piece, and then that maybe the viewers can make uh, their own conclusions of it, you know? But there is not one way to do it, which I think is, this is one of the main uh, problems of the miniature community that we want this fast food you know we want to know how to do this like quickly mm -hmm. and it's like bro there is not one way to do it indeed if you study different artists different comic comic cover artists they all treat these things <clears throat> differently you know mm -hmm. there are things in common but maybe the colors that uh, a guy has used for the superman cover that i'm seeing here maybe it won't be the same kind of colors that other people will do and also the relationship between shapes and and shadows and and colors here is not realistic at all it's like no. for example the superman he has a violet main light on the on the forehead mm. right and this is not related with the light on the on the chest for example mm. why yeah. because some because sometimes you have to lie the viewer to make a visual trick yeah does it make sense or yeah no of course completely we allowed to uh also have you mugged you off there lionel earlier you're um, regretting the guy. are we allowed to are we well models you don't do you see this stuff as much in the models people lying or is it it's ultra realistic as what people crave for because I, I myself, yeah, the rim light, not rim light, uh, the light, the the pink, the pink light on Superman's forehead, right? Is mm -hmm. to add a bit of, I guess, draw attention that his face is still there. Give it some volume. Give it some kind of. Yeah, that that that's a good example because he, for example, he has two rim lights in both sides. These rim lights that he has here, both are a kind of like yellowish orange, right? Mm. Very 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 intense. This yellow is orange stand out because it's surrounded by a lot of a big uh, mass uh, of, of of blue, which is an opposite color. Uh, but then it's harmonized because the whole uh, environment it has these kind of colors. But these kind of colors are not on the upper part. The upper part is surrounded by a darker and reddish orange, while the lighter or brighter orange and is also yellowish. It's on the bottom right so it's the opposite game right while then he is full of blue and red and then why not he has some kind of lilac in the middle that separates by a, by a kind of like small terminator uh that is this darker color that divides the rim light and then it makes a, a perfect blending onto the lilac uh light that is on the front yeah. you know what i mean so is this decision the only way to do it Definitely not. Is it is a way? Is a good way to do it? Yes, it works because it works, and everything that works is good. You know, is this the way that I will do it myself? Well, maybe not. You know, it's the same as when you check the hair. The hair has some uh, blue reflections and some more grayish reflections, right? Why why none of them are so affect so much affected by the the orangey rim light? Mm. When it's the same plane. <clears throat> and if it hits here, it will hit here. But if you do this, you will enter in another discussion, which is when you start making things too complex and you lose this simplicity, you lose you start to lose the style and it and it became something else. You know what I mean? Yeah. So a key yeah. a key of creating for creating a kind of comic style or this 
or this comic style, this spe special comic style, it will be to keep certain things simple or simplistic, right? To reduce the amount of uh, elements, which is super complex. Uh, and that's the reason why, for example, the, the, the darkest shadows are purely black. Black is no information, really. It, it, mm. it's, not a, it's not a colored black, mainly. Some, part, some parts, they are like reddish. But mainly, it's not a colored black. It's just black, right? You cannot do this in a, in a, in a miniature. Because as soon as you make the 360 and you're watching the miniature, this black will reboot some light, right? So it will turn gray. And here's where, when we were developing this, we had to think, oh, fuck, uh, we cannot use like Vallejo black. What can we use? Some, we need something deeper. OK, let's go for black ink. Oh, this is too fluid. It doesn't cover really well. OK, so let's mix black ink with Vallejo black. Oh, now it's much better, but maybe it's too satin. OK, so let's use uh, ultra matte varnish. Oh, fuck, now it turns more grayish. Uh, and it's not deep enough. OK, why if we use the properties of colors, like, for example, the depth of the dark blue, a kind of like dark Prussian blue, something like this. Mm -hmm. And then we add this to black. And suddenly, it turns into the more black, the blackest black ever, right? Mm -hmm. And then you apply this and it works better. But this is a development. It's a development, it's a development towards an, uh, uh, the execution of a, a specific style and also to reduce the amount of information. Because if, if on the black, the black, is, the black is just an example to exemplify that certain areas should be reduced of information. They have to have a lack of information to push some other parts, if that makes sense, to force the focus or the focal attention towards other points on, on the miniature, right? If you paint this as a like like a canvas, which is more like what I like to do, actually, full of brushstroke with a lot of with a lot of tonal variations, where you will find hundreds of very tiny uh, color decisions, tonalities that became nuances and things that are very subtle. If you do this, it will turn into a beautiful. Um, fantasy illustration, but it won't be comic anymore because it's not simple enough. And when I'm saying simple, I'm not saying in a bad way. I'm saying mm -hmm. as a price, you know? Like, uh, to me, the biggest quality of some of these paintings is how good they convey a message by not so many uh, elements, which also makes sense in the way of how they resolve those colorizing because most of the times uh, the, the the draftsman is a guy and the colorizer is another guy mm. makes sense yeah. yeah which is which is also related to how normally the box art painting works where the draftsman is the sculptor mm. and and the painter is the colorizer right <clears throat> so at some point if you try to make something very difficult like for example um I remember doing for night models uh, the cone doku, you know, cone doku from Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is this is this interesting or um? No, it is. No, it is. Getting boring. Cone Jamie, doku are you bored? Is, is, it was it was well. well I'm still, <clears throat> I'm still just <laughs> stuck on how uh, how I don't know, man. Like art's just sometimes I think it's too much. It's just too like it's this it's when 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 you when you get when the more <laughs> knowledge you get the further away it seems you are from <laughs> being good <laughs> is it is it not beautiful it's it, yeah it, it's 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 i think it's fantastic it's it's yeah it is it's also I, have the, I have the feeling i have the feeling now that i have been surpassed by many painters uh and this makes me feel um you enjoy the challenge yeah, it makes me feel uncomfortable in one way because I feel weak again. But at the same time, it's a, it's a great challenge because now I have to renew my my skill set, my toolbox, my ways of understanding, and that, that is that is fantastic. But obviously, um, I think that if you learn how to observe, uh, even if you translate this into your own words, because most of the criticism of, especially you know, haters that loves to criticize and everything that they say is something stupid for them. 
uh, they think that it's all based on uh, uh, explaining things in, in the right term with the right word. Uh, well, first of all, English is not my language, so I don't have the I don't have the perfect words to explain something, and some I could be missing something in my explanation because my English is not perfect. But in the other hand, uh, at least for from my experience, I've learned that translating what you observe to yourself, like speaking to yourself in your own words, make things easier to be understood, because most of the times you don't uh, really observe what you are doing. And you don't really observe what you are seeing, you know. You just try to copy something and replicate something. So it's not the same to be a photocopy, you know, like a photocopy machine, you know. Mm. It's not the same that than to interpret something that you are seeing. It's a it's a completely different thing, right? Yeah. I've seen Jamie doing uh, the last uh, exercise he did for uh, the journey pledge <laughs> because. Those two guys are now actually on the journey pledge. I don't know if they will be for for more more time, uh, especially Jamie, uh, because I'm very very hard with him. Uh, because it, it bothers me, it fucking annoy me that much <laughs> that 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 you know how to make a skin tone. You have done a skin tone with me. I have asked you the right questions and you have given me the right answers. Like Jamie, what do I need here? Oh, I think that you need a little bit of red. Good. Jamie, what, what do you need here? Oh, I think it's a little bit dry. You need a little bit more flow, more fluid, no? The paint, so a little bit of ink. Okay, blah, blah, blah. What do you need? Oh, I think it's a little bit darker. So can I use what? White maybe? Yes, I can. You know, and you can make this reasoning, but then when you do your own exercise at home, the reason why you don't succeed is because you don't stop. You don't speak to yourself. You don't speak to your own process and you don't observe. You know, when you observe, and you analyze things uh, from a crit, uh, critical yeah, point critical. of view, <clears throat> yeah. uh, then so. you have you have to structureize this analyze. You have to say, okay, this is what I'm seeing. This is how this this divided. This is how this guy treat this. And now it comes the why's. Okay, not only how he does it, you know, instead of why he did it in this way and not in any other way, because now it comes my knowledge or your knowledge about whatever color theory. So I can say, okay, he uh, Superman. He has this red cape. <laughs> Why this red cape is uh, is not, let's say, darker? If the red cape would be darker, if you see, there are no blacks on the red cape. Yeah, there are, there are many blacks on the blue, but not on the red cape. I have not spoken with the artist, so maybe he has any other reasons. But it's a good thing. It's like when you read uh, poetry, that you have to un understand it for yourself. You don't need to to know what he wanted to say. You need to translate this into your own uh, comprehension, right? So then I think, okay, if he made if he made the cape the red cape darker, it will make sense in terms of perspectives, you know, uh, and it will separate the different planes so that maybe his front part will be even more focused, right? Could be, but maybe then you will load this area with too much uh, darkness, you know, the, 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 the value level will be too dark. So maybe that's a, a, a reason. Maybe he wants to emphasize the blue and don't uh, work too much on the red because the red somehow visually merge with the overall uh, feeling of this orangey background. Maybe that could be a reason. You know, there, are, there could be many reasons for many things, but the key is to try to analyze enough so that you can come out come up with your own conclusions about what you're seeing because then is when you are able to start translating what you're seeing into your models if that makes sense and then when it works or when it doesn't work in your model you can search for possible reasons sometimes you will uh, hit on the target sometimes not but at least this process is a better way to translate because it's like a puzzle right where you are playing with pieces of this puzzle, quiz, no puzzle, puzzle like puzzle, yeah. Puzzle, puzzle. Puzzle. Uh, but in this case, the puzzle is not just a flat image, and that's it. It has reasons for what it could be in this place and not in the other place. Sometimes when I correct my students, I see things that are really well done in the wrong area, and that's important because it, yeah. it doesn't matter if it's amazingly well done. If it's in the wrong area, maybe I'm 
looking at the feet of the whatever, the Luke Skywalker, uh, while his face is crying because, uh, I don't know, because he lose uh, a bet on the casino. I don't know. Make sense? Yeah. I think, yeah. So I think the, the only, the I only think, way... Oh, go on. Sorry, I think what we'll do now is we'll we'll come back in a future episode and we'll start looking at Alfonso's work uh, now that we've got that foundation. Um, so join us in the next episode when we start looking at Alfonso's pieces. Once again, guys, it really helps us if you like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoy the content. If you can leave, take some time out to leave a comment below, we do really enjoy reading them. We do respond to them, so that would be nice as well. And hopefully if we see that, we'll be encouraged to produce more content like this. So we'll catch you on the next episode. Thank <laughs> you.